States of America. Lord, we ask that uh, uh, you would guide the, uh, the leadership of our country and, and, uh, and give wisdom and knowledge uh, beyond our, our human abilities. But again, Lord, we thank you for the freedom that we enjoy uh, here, and we pray that, that those freedoms would be preserved and continue to be preserved. Lord, we thank you for the desire that you give us to be here the want to, to get up and get ourselves together and, and come out, uh, especially on a cold day, and to be a part of the fellowship of the saints, that we might receive instruction and encouragement from your words. Lord, we all come with burdens and concerns of life. Uh, we all come with family problems and financial problems and medical and health problems, people that we love and people that we know uh, that have issues of life. Lord, we Again, ask that you would use each of those things to draw folks to yourself, that fo folks might seek to have a real genuine relationship with you and to learn and study from your word uh, what it is you're doing in this present evil world. And Lord, again, we thank you for each one that comes and that's come here today. Lord, we would ask that you'd allow us to set aside these concerns of life for a little while, that you'd captivate our hearts and minds, that we might have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand. And at the end, Lord, we have uh, a greater knowledge of you and uh, we're better equipped to go out as your ambassadors uh, with the gospel of grace and the truth of your word. I want to tell you that we love you today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, very good. We're in the book of Colossians and we've been studying through the book. Um, we are in chapter 1. Is, does anyone need a Bible? Does everybody have a Bible that needs a Bible? Okay, everybody good to go? All right, because we always keep a couple of extras just in case. All right, so we're in the book of Colossians. And uh, we're going to pick up at verse 9. And we're going to read through verse 14. And this is uh, Paul's prayer for the folks at Colossae. And uh, we have pretty much covered verse 9. We're going to try to move a little faster as we walk through uh, the rest of this prayer, and we'll see how far we get today. All right, very good. So we're in Ben, Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And so as we've been doing this, we have been breaking this down. We've been talking about uh, these folks there at Colossae, and we've begun looking at this prayer, and we spent uh, probably a couple of weeks looking at uh, verse 9, that, we might be, that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And so we talk about knowing the will of God and being filled with the knowledge of His will. 
And of course, how is it that we know the will of God? We, we only can know the will of God by getting in the Word of God and reading and studying and understand God's Word as He's written to us and the information that He has for us today. And so that's how we know that and have a knowledge of His will. Uh, our mind is conformed, uh, uh, is not conformed to this world, but it's transformed. Our mind is renewed as we get into the Word of God and study that we might have the knowledge of His will. We finished that up, I think, last week over there in pretty much a verse that we use as our foundational verse uh, over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, where it says, God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. And so ultimately, as we go about our lives and our ministry, we know that God's will, wherever we are, whatever, uh, we, whatever situation, circumstance of life we find ourselves in, uh, we know that it's God's will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, which gives us then a responsibility. We need to know what the gospel of the, the saving grace of God is. We need to know how to effectively communicate that gospel. We need to know where to find the gospel of our salvation in our Bible. We have to be equipped. And so if it's God's will that all men be saved, then we need to know how to tell folks how to be saved. And there's lots of confusion about that. And so you want to make sure that you understand the gospel. Paul makes it real clear in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, the gospel that he preached, the gospel of our salvation, is how that Christ died for our sins. And he was buried, and he was raised again for our justification. And that's as simple as that. Uh, Jesus died for our sins, but he didn't stay dead. Hallelujah. Amen. He came forth out of the grave. And if they're in 1 Corinthians 15, as you continue reading through there, we know that if Jesus didn't come out of that grave, we have no gospel. And so our gospel is not just that Jesus died for our sins, which indeed he did, but it's not only that, but he didn't stay dead. He came forth victorious out of that grave. As we continue and study and we dig deeper, you go to Romans 4, you go to Romans 5, and we learn even more about that, that he was raised for our justification. And so we need to know and understand the gospel uh, and so that we can tell other folks how to be saved because, uh, as we all know, there's lots of confusion out there uh, in churchianity about what it means and what it takes to be saved. It doesn't take walking an aisle. It doesn't take uh, getting baptized in water. It doesn't take, uh, you know, all these things that people list and tell you you got to do. All one has to do to be saved today is simply trust what God has told us that Jesus died for our sins. And of course it becomes real personal, doesn't it? Jesus died for my sin. And Jesus was buried and he was raised again for my justification. And so we come back with that. So we know the will of God is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised again for our justification. It's God's will that all men be saved. So we are prepare ourselves so we can effectively and scripturally and doctrinally correctly share the gospel. And then he says that all men be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. And anytime I'm in that passage, I emphasize that salvation is an instantaneous event. The moment you realize you're a sinner, can't save yourself, and you trust what Christ did alone for your salvation, you're saved by the grace of God that very moment. It's an instantaneous event. But then coming unto the knowledge of the truth, that's kind of a process. It takes some time. And we have to, again, get in the Word of God, know who God's talking to, when He's talking to them, what He's talking about, and, and understand the Scripture that's too far about us today in the body of Christ so that we find the doctrine that's about us today in the body of Christ. We often say that all the Bible is for us, but not all of the Bible is to us or about us. And so we have to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And so we learn. Of course, we always go there from to 2 Timothy 2.15, where the Bible tells us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So that tells us the Word of God has to be studied and it has to be rightly divided. Once again, knowing who God's talking to, what He's talking about, who the instrument is that He's using, what was the ministry of that instrument, all of those things. And so again, as we look at verse 9, that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, we kind of build upon that. So once one is 
filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, then on top of that then comes that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. And so when we know, have an understanding of the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, then from there we begin to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. In other words, living our lives in such a way and preaching and teaching and sharing with others the truth of God's Word in a way that, bring, that is pleasing unto the Lord. There's folks out there that go to church, and, but they're teaching and preaching false doctrine. Is that pleasing to the Lord? No, it's not. And so when, we're, when we have a knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, from there we're able to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, and then it says being fruitful in every good work. Now again, there's lots of works out there. Lots of good works out there. Uh, uh, you know, just as far as a broad paintbrush definition. But we have to be careful about whether or not those works are pleasing unto the Lord, whether they're doctrinally sound. And so as we walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, we want to make sure that that work is a good work according to Scripture. Um, uh, if, if there's an organization out there that's doing good things, let's call it a religious organization. If there's a religious organization out there that is, that is doing good things, but the gospel that's associated with that organization is not the gospel of the grace of God, should we be involved in that organization? No. So we have to be, uh, we say it like this, everything that calls itself Christian is not Christian. Amen. I mean, there's just the truth of it. Everything that calls itself Christian is not Christian. Well, how do I know? How do I discern? How do I have an understanding or a knowledge? Well, you know, they all carry the name Christian, but which ones really are of the Lord and which ones are not? Well, it comes back to we, we have to have some doctrinal understanding of the Word of God. We have to have the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. When we have that, then we're able to walk worthy unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. And so we use discernment. Uh, people will often ask about a ministry. They'll, they'll approach me or, you know, be a Facebook group or something, and they'll ask about a particular ministry, a particular church or a particular, uh, uh, you know, whatever work or ministry it might be. And my first response is, go check out their doctrinal statement. Go find their statement of faith. Go to their website, go to wherever they are, look for their doctrinal statement. See what they have to say about salvation. See what they have to say about the doctrines as they relate to us today. And if the doctrine is sound and they have the gospel of the grace of God and they understand uh, certain things, well then that's a good work. And it would be pleasing to the Lord to, to support and be a part of that good work. But now, if you go to that doctrinal statement and it's not right, I don't care what kind of name's on it. Keep your wallet in your pocket. And don't share and don't help and don't be a part of supporting or becoming involved in that kind of work, that kind of ministry. And so we have to have some discernment. And that all comes back to knowing our Bible. Because everybody that stands behind a pulpit this morning is not preaching the truth. That's tough words right there, but it's the true words. Amen. And so, uh, you know, again, we often say this, that uh, uh, the devil is not busy in the honky-tonks and the whorehouses and the drug dens. The devil is not busy on Saturday night. Our own flesh takes us to those kinds of places. Let me tell you where the devil's busy. 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock on Sunday morning in pulpits all around the country and all around the world. That's where the devil's busy. Because here's the thing. If people are searching for God and if people have, a, have an interest in knowing something about God, where's the devil best able to confuse and deceive those people? <coughs> Behind the pulpit with some guy who's able to wax eloquent and use the Bible to do it. 
And so Satan's busy perverting the truth and perverting the gospel and perverting the doctrines uh, in the Word of God. He's busy perverting that. And so we have to examine, we have to have some knowledge, we have to have some understanding of Scripture. And so as we are filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, then that we might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and then increasing in the knowledge of God. Remember we said God's will is that all men be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Our desire is, is as we read and study the Word of God, that we learn more today than we knew yesterday. And then next week, we know more next week than we knew last week. And so we're increasing in the knowledge of God. Once again, is that by uh, the things that we experience? Or, does that, or is that by a studying and an understanding of the Word of God? It's by a study and understanding of the Word of God. Let me throw this out too. Do you think that religious experience might be used of the devil to confuse people from the truth of the word? A lot of times you go to talk to somebody about the truth of the word of God and here's what God says and here's what God tells us today and they say, yeah, but I experienced this, this happened to me, that happened to me. And they start giving experiences and they elevate experiences above the truth of the Word of God. Had a man uh, here in Cock County that we went to church with for several years. Uh, he actually came and worked with us in our business for a, a few years back and for a little while. And he and I would be in the van and we'd be out working and doing things. Of course, with that opportunity, we talked a lot about Scripture and about the Word of God. And one day he looked at me and he said these words. He said, Sam, he said, I figured out the difference between you and I. He said, you're all about the truth of the book. And he said, and I'm all about the experience. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> that was one of his phrases, by the way. And uh, unbelievable. And that was certain, and it certainly is. It's unbelievable. That's what he told me. He said, you're all about the truth and I'm all about the experience. And in result, he was saying, even if the experience is not according to the truth, I would still rather have that experience. Now, there's nothing wrong with uh, uh, feeling good, right? There's nothing wrong with hearing... Uh, well, y'all know, but listen... You know me, of anybody in this room, I'm going to tear up and cry uh, over the goodness and the grace of God just as fast or faster than anybody in this room. You know, there's a few songs that I go to singing and I think about what they mean to me and uh, uh, I tear up. So again, back at verse 10 and pick this up. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So again, as we're talking about this being fruitful, increasing in the knowledge of God, we're emphasizing the importance of, of knowing the truth of the Word of God over experience and never valuing some religious experience over the truth of the Word of God. And like I said, people, there's nothing wrong with you know hearing a good song or hearing a good message and, and God moving in your heart and mind and it's stirring your emotions. Praise the Lord for that. But we got to make sure. Uh, folks go to church. They have a really good time. I mean, the music is good. And the preacher walked up and down the aisle and shouted. And the, they had an invitation and sang ten verses of Just As I Am. And the altars were full. And you get off and you leave and you go off out to the community the afternoon and you sit down at Cracker Barrel or Lawson's or wherever you're going to eat lunch and you say, boy, what a wonderful service that was. What a good time. I mean, God came down and met with us. And then you say, what did the preacher preach? Well, I don't know, but it was sure good. <laughs> I mean, there was shouting and singing, and I mean, and we equate shouting and singing and, and good feelings as being spiritual 
And yet all that shouting and feelings and all that stuff may not have had an ounce of truth in it, but boy, we had a good time. Mm -hmm. Paul said, I'm praying. I don't cease to pray for you in verse 9, that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, and that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Shouting and carrying around in things that are not true, just because it's a wonderful experience, that's not pleasing. Being fruitful in every good work, just because it calls itself Christian, doesn't make it a good work. Is it doctrinally sound? And of course we have to know our Bible to know whether it's doctrinally sound, and is it increasing in the knowledge of God? I mean, when we walk away, do I know more about my Bible? Do I know about God? Do I know more about God? Do I know more about what God's doing when I walk away than I did when I walked in? There we go. All right, now verse 11. As we continue, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. So if I'm filled with the knowledge of His will... And I walk worthy of walking worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. What does that do for me? It strengthens me. Strengthen. So we're filled, we're increasing, and now we're strengthened with all might according to what? His glorious power. So once again, who's doing the work? He is. We're strengthened with all might according to His glory and power. And then notice, this is strange how this verse finishes up. Unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. So I'm filled with the knowledge of His will. I'm increasing in the knowledge of God. And I'm strengthened with His might according to His glorious power. And what does that do? Unto all patience and long suffering. Think about that. We deal with this all the time. We talk about teaching truth in drips and cups, not buckets and barrels. Patience and long-suffering. We talk about planting a seed and walking away. Patience and long-suffering. We talk about we have, to, we have to lead folks. You can't push folks. And how many times have we given that illustration? When you go to pushing somebody... Or if somebody pushes you, what's your first instinct? To resist and push back. And so we have to have patience and long suffering. So as we're, as we're understanding the knowledge of His will, we're walking worthy unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, get it, being strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, all that's unto all patience and long suffering. So as we approach folks with the gospel of the grace of God, we have to be patient and long suffering. We can sit down and argue and debate and mentally convince somebody, but if somebody makes a decision simply because we mentally overcame them, or we out-argued them, so they said, okay, I give up, I'll do what you want. How real is that? That's not very real. And so we have to be careful, we have to be patient, we have to be long-suffering as we share the gospel, as we share the truth of the Word of God. We're patient and we're long-suffering, uh, and we do that with joyfulness. It reminds me of a verse over here, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Of course, we're in 2 Timothy 2 a whole lot, but when you get through all of 2 Timothy chapter 2, you get to those last three verses of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 24, 25, 26. I think this ties in real well with all patience and long suffering with, joy, with joyfulness. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God for adventure will give them repentance, what is repentance? Change of mind, right? 
if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement or the acknowledging of the truth and that they may and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And so as we learn and understand the knowledge of his will, as we increase in the knowledge of his God of God, as we're as we're strengthened with might, according you know, with, with according to his glorious power, then we approach folks with patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Jeanette told me this morning, she said uh, she had checked out things that differ. And she's got a friend from days gone by that moved to Bulls Gap. And she was there over Thanksgiving holiday. And uh, these folks are going to a Methodist church. And uh, she said she believes he's, they've come to know the Lord, but they're in a Methodist church. She carried the book over there, Things That Differed, and he asked if he could keep it. Amen? Asked if he could keep it. Now, tying that in, just, you, you don't push, you don't bang somebody over the head, you don't sit down and try to explain to them why everything that their church is teaching them is wrong and incorrect and not sound doctrinally and not according to the truth of the Word of God. You, you just you plant a seed. You leave something and then with patience and with long-suffering and joyfulness, and, and the whole purpose of the story is when Jeanette came up and told me, she said, I left that book with him. He said he wanted to read it and asked me if I would leave it with him. And you know what she was doing? <laughs> she was grinning. He asked if I would leave it with him. What is that? Joyfulness. And so we're patient and we're long-suffering. And then with joyfulness. I'll get into these Facebook conversations and and uh, uh, and I'll I'll say amen or I'll support something that somebody has said and something's done and somebody else will come back but but they don't do this they don't say that they don't and I I'll, I'll oftentimes will make this statement I appreciate truth wherever I find it joyfulness I don't care who they are if I hear a message preached by whoever or somebody make a statement by whoever, and, with, and that statement has doctrinal truth in it, I'm going to say amen, glory to God. Joyfulness. And then be patient and long-suffering that God, in using His Word, and if that person, whoever it might be, whether it's one of us or whoever it might be, as we continue to read and study our Bible and examine the truth of the Word of God and then open our hearts and minds as God reveals the truth of His Word to us in our study, then, then we pick up something. Every once in a while, one of you will come up and say, Brother Sam, you've been preaching this or you've taught this, but today it clicked. Well, what? I've been patient and I've been long-suffering. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes up and says, I got that today. I understood that today. What does that bring? Joyfulness. You know, I've said it. I, used to, I, I think I said this not <coughs> long ago, but uh, when we had the youth ministries, I used to, uh, on occasion, I would say, I'm going to preach a message today and I want to pass out cotton balls or earplugs and put it in one side of your head. And then I want to preach the message, and when you leave, I want to pass out another earplug and put it on the other side of your head. And then I want you to make sure you sleep on your back, not on your side, because I don't want it to leak out. And I was trying to make a point, wasn't I? I want you to hear this. I want you to get this. But whether you get it or hear it that particular day... Or if we preach it again some other time and we preach it again some other time and we preach it again some other time and then one day the light comes on and you say, wow, I got that. I understand that today. That's the idea of patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Because I believe this with all my heart. In the heart and mind of an individual 
who has genuinely been saved by the grace of God. If that individual who has genuinely been saved by the grace of God, there was a day, a time, and a place when they realized they couldn't save themselves, they trusted Christ alone for their eternal salvation, and they know that they're saved not because of what they've done, but because of everything that Jesus did. And the Holy Spirit of God moves in and dwells within their heart and mind. I believe that if that person who's been saved and indwelt by the grace of God and indwelt by the grace of God, if they have a desire to know the truth and will get in this book and study it, I believe that they can come to understand it. And I believe that with, you know, right person, right place, right time, they can come understand the truth of this word. And when they hear the truth, hear Right? You understand what I mean when I say hear the truth? When they hear the truth and they have a sincere desire to know the truth, I believe that God will bring forth that fruit in that heart and that life of the sincere believer who wants to know the truth of the Word of God. Now, I've also experienced times where they've, they've heard the truth and seen the truth, but it was going to cost them too much to walk in the truth, and so they turned their back on it and went the other way. I've seen that happen too many times too. But here we go. Alright? So, let's get back to uh, Colossians chapter 1. Verse 11, now into verse 12. Strengthen with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Well, that's a praise right there. We give thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Well, what does it mean to be made us meet to be partakers? Well, that word meet, we don't use it in this way very much anymore, but that word meet means fit. It means suitable. It means proper. It means qualified, conveniently adapted as to purpose or use. So he hath made us meet, or he's made us fit. He's made us suitable or proper, qualified. He's the one who does that. So we give thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers. So it's he. Uh, I've said I was going to preach a message and develop a message sometimes on what it means to be a new creature in Christ. And one of the things, that, and I think this would be one of those verses, because if we're a new creature, that means God made us, right? God made us. And so when a person today comes to faith in the finished work of Christ for their salvation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away, behold, all things will become new. Well, if he's a new creature, that means he's a new creation. And so that means God made something. Well, here it is. God made us. Part of that being a new creature, part of that being a new creation, is that God, we give thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So part of that new creation is He's made us suitable. He's made us fit. He's made us uh, uh, qualified. He's made us uh, adapted to for the specific purpose and use. It's His work within us that accomplishes that hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and lights. And what is our inheritance? We talk about our inheritance a lot. What is it that we know that we're going to inherit? Well, first and foremost, we know the place is heaven. We know that we have a, we're a heavenly people with a heavenly promise and a heavenly future. We've been promised to spend eternity in heaven. And we are already seated together in Christ in heavenly places. So that's our inheritance. Another part of our inheritance is that adoption, that redemption of this body. And we've talked a lot about that. One of these days, this old frail, carnal, sinful body is going to be cast aside. And we're going to be given a new body, glorified, fit for living in heaven throughout all eternity. Well, no, that's a strange thing to think about, but yet that's what Scripture teaches so we are, so again, verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness 
and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So it says, the, so the who is the who of verse 13? It's the Father. So the Father who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Well, let's look at that just for a few minutes. We've been delivered from the power of darkness. All right, look at Romans chapter 7 with me for a minute. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Well, what is it that we've been delivered from? Romans chapter 7. What does it mean, delivered from the power of darkness? Romans chapter 7, I believe it's verse 6. Romans 7, verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law... That being dead, when we're, wherein we were held, that we should serve it, newness of spirit, not nobleness of letter. Do you know that a person who is trying to become justified by keeping the law, that they're in, are they in darkness or are they in light? They're in darkness. If someone is trying to keep the law, and I mean whether that's the law of Moses or or oh, well, that's the law of such and such denominational church. Right? If someone is trying to keep the law in order to gain righteousness or earn righteousness with God, they're in darkness. And so Colossians tells us that God the Father hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Romans 7 tells us part of that means we are delivered from the law. We're no longer under law, but we're under grace. We have been delivered from the law. There's no law that you can keep that will make you right with God. Praise the Lord. And the only, the, the only thing that makes any of us right with God is not what we do, but it's what Jesus already did in our simple faith and trust and belief and reliance on Him for that righteousness. All right? He's delivered us from the power of darkness. Look at Romans chapter 8 and look at verse uh, 21. <clears throat> Delivered from the power of darkness. Let's start at verse 18. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Verse 21, Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now he goes on, well, let's go and read verse 22, 23. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even where we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. And so there it is, that transformation that takes place, the redemption of our body. So verse 1, 21 again talks about with the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. And so what does that mean? Well, in the context it means that we're delivered from this bondage that we have in this old earthly flesh, this old earthly carnal flesh. And so he's delivered us then from the law. He's delivered us from the bondage of this flesh. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. verse 9 and 10. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Where am I at? I want to make sure. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Okay, I want to make sure I said the right place. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God which raiseth the dead who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom, in whom we, also, we trust in whom we trust that he will yet deliver. And so we see that deliverance then 
again in, in God which raises the dead. And so we continue on with this idea of deliverance. Go with me one more place. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. From Colossians, you turn over one more book to 1 Thessalonians. To your right there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look at verse 9 and 10. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven. What's that? The rapture of the church, catching away the body of Christ, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now what is the wrath to come? It's that coming tribulation time. The, the Bible talks about the tribulation, that seven-year tribulation, that time of the outpouring of the wrath of God, the time of Jacob's trouble, the 70th week of Daniel, all those things. It says we have been delivered from the wrath to come. And so that's part of how we know. How do I know the church, the body of Christ, is not going through the tribulation? Because the Bible tells us that the tribulation is the time of the outpouring of the wrath of God and we have been delivered from the wrath to, from the wrath to come. Alright, so now let's go back to Colossians chapter 1. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. How many of you remember the TV show Star Trek? Y'all remember Star Trek? Y'all know Star Trek? Y'all too young for Star Trek? Elizabeth doesn't know Star Trek. <coughs> I don't know You know Star Trek? Yeah. Elizabeth doesn't know Star Trek. She's fixing to be 10. She's fixing to be 10 next month. Right? Yeah. And uh, so Star Trek. Remember, remember that phrase, beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> beam me up Scotty and Scotty was the technician and he ran the thing and, and uh, you know Captain Kirk and whoever might be off on some planet somewhere and, and uh, Scotty would be back on the ship and, and Captain Kirk would get on the little communicator you know the cell phone <laughs> back before they had cell phones and uh, he would talk to Scotty the uh, I guess he was Irish or Scottish, or Scottish, Scotty, he would be Scottish, wouldn't he? And so he would talk to Scotty and he'd say, beam me up, Scotty. And Scotty would push some buttons and all of a sudden, Captain Kirk and whoever was with him on that planet out there would be translated from that place back onto the ship. They were moved from one place to another. Translated. The only other place in our Bible where translated is used, and let's go there real quick so I can make my points. Only two places in the Bible, all the Bible, the word translated is used. And go with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. Talks about Enoch. If you remember way back there in Genesis, it talks about Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. Well, here we have Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And so Enoch walked with God. Enoch pleased God. And one day, Enoch was no more here. All of a sudden, he was with God. He was translated. He uses the word three times in that one verse. And so when we come back here to verse 13 of chapter 1 of Colossians, God our Father, who hath translated us from the power of darkness, or excuse me, hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. And so that means He took us out of the kingdom of this world and He put us into 
the kingdom of His Son. When did that take place? The moment we believe. Now once again, we start talking about eternal security of the believer and our position and our standing in Christ. We were translated. We were delivered from this present evil world. We're delivered from this old carnal body. We're delivered to the heavenly places. We're delivered from the coming tribulation. And God has translated us or already taken us out of this place and putting us in in heaven with Christ and that's why he says in Ephesians we're seated together in heavenly places in Christ we've been translated now let me does, does that say that's a future thing it says it's a done deal doesn't it hath translated us somebody says well uh, if you commit this sin or that sin can you lose your salvation well God would have to untranslate you wouldn't he we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son it's already been accomplished now, I won't have time to develop verse 14. We'll stop for now. But it goes on and says, uh, of course, the, it translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son in whom? Well, what's the in whom? His dear Son in Christ. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So how is it we have redemption? We have redemption in Christ. And it's through the blood of Christ that we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. What's the song say? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All right, let's stop for now. We'll uh, talk more about verse 14 next time. But let's take our word. Thank you.